So um, as we're here in Australia, um, acknowledgement of country is very important to us. We respectfully acknowledge and pay respect to the past, present and future traditional custodians and elders of this nation and the continuation of cultural, spiritual and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We respectfully acknowledge the Garna and the First Nations peoples and their elders past and present who are the First Nations traditional owners of the lands that are now home to the University of South Australia's campuses here in South Australia. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Belinda Bindi McGill, who is our keynote speaker today. And Belinda has kindly um, extending her, her keynote to, to cover the space that uh, Bianca couldn't fill today. So Dr. Belinda McGill, or Bindi, is a senior lecturer at the University of South Australia in Education Futures and a full member of the Centre for Research in Educational and Social Inclusion, known as CRESI. Dr. McGill's research interests draw upon the fields of Indigenous education, culturally responsive pedagogy and arts education, post-colonial theory, visual methodologies and critical race theory, and much of her work is focused on decolonization through arts-based pedagogies and creative methodologies. Dr. McGill's recent research projects have explored the potential of virtual reality in com combination with sh uh, creative and embodied strategies to develop a strategic response to bullying. She also runs institutes on creative and body-based learning, CBL, for developing effective and inclusive pedagogies for all learners. She has published a broad range of articles concerned with post-colonial receptivity, teaching in the contact zone, critical pedagogy and feminist art theory. She has also authored several book chapters, including recently, Decolonization, Ethics of Care and Arts Education in the book, Reimagining Just Education, and the chapter Dialogue Across Difference, Global Conversations on Teacher Identity and the Ethics of Care published in the book Drama for Schools in 2020. So what I'll do is I'll just pass right across to Bindi. Bindi, would you like to share your screen? And welcome. Can you see that on full screen? Great, that's good. Uh, Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today. And um, I also acknowledge that I'm standing on the lands of Ghana people and pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. And today I'll be sharing um, three big ideas. Firstly, building a culturally responsive pedagogy informed by a decolonial framework. Then generating understanding of this pluralist worldview in relation to including letting art teach, so the role of art building an expanded understanding of visual codes and conventions and embodying deep listening and dialogic meaning making. Thirdly, I'll be looking at building somatic knowledge through embodied strategies known as creative body-based learning as an example of how I work with students to generate a deeper understanding of how we sit relationally in the world. So the decolonizing project is a global issue, but one that requires a local lens. Whilst decolonization itself is a pro term to problematize, it must advance the significant theoretical work of Edward Said, Chakrabarti, Spivak, Fanon, and others that so powerfully articulated the epistemological and physical violence of colonialism and imperialism. Rethinking these debates within the context of decolonization, considerations must turn to the material effect such as the return of sovereign land and territory back to the First Nation people, as well as decolonizing epistemies in and through the curriculum and research. And my slides haven't moved, but that's okay. I'm sure they will. Within the specific context in Australia, retro assimilation continues in ways to marginalize and discriminate based on race. The word race is itself is from a mix of Latin, French, Italian, and English that found its form in relations to humans through the hierarchies of the races outlined in social Darwinism. This social construct was mobilized for the purposes of territorial occupation in Australia and elsewhere around the globe. In the context of my Jewish ancestry, race and anti-Semitism was used to marginalize, persecute, and deny citizenship rights. So as you can see on this map, in the Australian context, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people never ceded sovereignty 
and occupation of Australia by Britain was in fact an illegal occupation under international law, as the land was not terra nullius, but had 250 sovereign nations, as you can see by this image. This was one of many illegal manoeuvres since 1788 that Borrick trusts and goodwill. So this talk highlights the ongoing resistance against the state and these constructs and the way in which art is deployed as a political weapon and generates hopefulness through dialogic meaning making. Throughout, I'll be using CBL strategies to generate dialogic meaning making in relation to the theme of decolonisation. So you may be unmuted <laughs> as um, Deborah was talking about before at different points of this talk. So part of the decolonizing practice is to look for the disparities of accounts and the mechanisms of silencing and erasure, the pedagogical focus of site-specific texts, coupled with re-reading of the visual landscape and the semiotic fields from which artworks are produced, informs a decolonizing visual methodology. So just uh, to outline, as um, uh, Lorraine mentioned, creative body-based learning is a strategy that we use and I'll go into detail about that and we'll be engaging in some strategies in relation to that. But there is a focus on the combination or the triangulation of the academic effect effective and aesthetic learning through dialogic meaning making. Um, and we'll do some strategies as we go through. So this slide here is by Yoni Skers, um, Kokotha, uh, a woman who uh, did this piece and she talks about this idea of whiteness. So how can we contribute to decolonization in this increasingly neoliberal time that arrays culture, identity, and belonging in multiple ways? A pedagogical response is required that instructs us to sit relationally and not at the center of the world where we encounter each other within an ethics of care that turns us towards new ways of seeing and new modes of engagement that advance transformative and reparative justice. Part of the decolonizing project is to unveil the practice of objective vision where worlds are compartmentalized to construct difference. However, preceding this pedagogical turn, understandings of standpoint and institutional whiteness becomes a critical nexus. Scarce's work here is titled Cultivation of Whiteness, done in 2013. And her work conjures imaginings of scientific experimentation with fragile specimens of glass material in jars. Scarce is reconfiguring the circuit of culture as Hall outlined by issuing the theme of social Darwinism and the dehumanizing practices of anthropologists and scientists under the jurisdiction of the colonial enterprise. The material effect of colonial practices informed by social Darwinism and biological determinism was rife across the globe. In this sense, Scarce is asking her audience to look and understand the ways in which looking is a visceral practice. The spectrum jars reference biological racism peddled through biopolitics and enacted through juridical power under the Assimilation Act in Australia, which was between 1930 and 1960 in the first half of the 20th century. And these contravened human rights and the rights to self-determination. So in what ways can we reconsider political agency that tells another story that shifts the regime of biopower and juridical power enacted by the state and more broadly, settler societies. The pedagogical turn has emerged in multiple forms through the field of art and law. The pedagogical maneuver is to look for the spaces in between, not just the words, but also the silences, the misrepresentations within the discursive regimes of art, history, and the assumed logic that constructed such narrative. These pedagogical maneuvers was not only conducted in relation to the state, but as you know, as a form of public pedagogy. In part, nationalism was a project formed through policy, but also public pedagogy in museums that built a vision on what constituted nationhood. The world as exhibition was designed to narrow the gaze whereby objectivity was a required mode of interpreting and thus enabled separation from the lives of the people from the object where the, the objects came. 
So extending Edward Said's seminal post-colonial analysis of technologies of categorizations of material culture in galleries and museum, we can reconsider the modes of knowledge production that were produced through reductive binaries that were taught in universities and schools and re-examine it through a decolonial lens. So in relation to pedagogy and decolonization, we're thinking about universities in the school context, both globally and locally. So many of the students that I work with at university are diverse, but with little knowledge of indigenous settler history or the policies of segregation, assimilation and self-determination managed under the Australian state. In fact, in line with Professor Irabina Rigney's question, I ask, how do we know what we know? And this unpeels the layer by which students recognise their own education system has failed to embed Indigenous perspectives into the curriculum and thereby erase Indigenous knowledges. So what role does pedagogy play in decolonisation? The use of embodied creative learning is a useful tool. Creative and body-based learning that I and um, other colleagues use is an effective way to unpack Western epistemies that sit not only in the mind, but also the body. This work evolved out of arts-based pedagogy influenced by the critical and transformative work of Augustus Boal, a Brazilian dramaturg who founded the Theatre of the Oppress to transform lives of spectators to become actors and agents of change. So this pedagogical turn includes the embodied strategies strategically scaffolded through questions that are discussed within a dialogic meaning-making framework, thereby students reassemble themselves as particular moments in conversation and through their own creative practice. This routinely leads to those aha moments by students about maybe their own privilege and its intersection with colon colonisation, whiteness and Western epistemology. So these learning journeys are built within an ethics of care and supports the reassemblage of students' understandings of themselves. This takes time as most pedagogical work does take time. The benefit of creative embodied strategies is the ways in which cognitive, affective and aesthetic domains work together to generate meaning and understanding. So we're gonna have a go at this um, embodied creative body-based learning strategy. And this one's called Vote With Your Feet. So we'll have a go. Um, so essentially have a chance to have a look at these two images. And my um, job is to facilitate um, only a three part step, which is you'll vote with your feet. And if you agree with what I say, you'll stand up. If you disagree, you'll stay seated. If you're not sure, you'll stay somewhere in, in between. So for example, I'll say something and vote with your feet. So you might stand up, make sure you don't have your jammies on like me, stand up if you agree, hover if you're not sure, and stay seated if you disagree. So we'll have a look at these two images. Um, and like I said, this strategy is called vote with your feet. So vote with your feet if you feel comfortable viewing both images. So we'll vote with our feet. So I feel comfortable viewing both of these images. So I'm going to stand up. So even though we're on Zoom, we can still stand up. If you feel comfortable viewing these images. So Pauline's halfway, Lorraine's still sitting down, Deborah's still sitting down. So we've got a mix. I'm only sitting okay. down because I've got my pyjamas on, Bindi. So. <laughs> Okay, well, that's fair enough because uh, obviously we're at night time in Australia. Okay, so that's good. There was a bit of a mix and I can't see everyone right now, but that's um, we'll have another look with this one. Vote with your feet if you feel confident describing the signs, systems and its meaning in both images. So you might feel really comfortable describing the signs, systems and meaning in both images. If not, if you think maybe, just go halfway. If not, stay seated. Okay, Pauline's halfway and we've got Maddie's full. Uh, Esther, Dennis is staying seated. Uh, Claire's definitely staying seated. For example, Zoe's staying seated. Okay, so 
If possible, Lorraine, if you could unmute uh, or if someone's prepared to say why yeah. they they voted in the way they voted with their bodies. Does someone want to raise their hand? I can see you're in the participant list. So if someone wants to uh, answer that. I think Esther may have had something to say. Okay. Um, I didn't stand up because I... I I wouldn't be I wouldn't even I would be guessing if I was to be describing the image on the left. Okay, great. And um, Dennis is walking away, so I can't put him in the middle of it. <laughs> but I can certainly put um, uh, Pauline. How did you feel, Pauline? Um, I felt that um, although I, I have looked at Aboriginal artwork and can interpret a little bit of it i was uncertain um exactly about it so i was in the middle okay great and so when you said uncertain uh what did you mean by that what was the feeling around being uncertain sorry the, the viewpoint um of aboriginal artwork is totally different to western and i've studied um, various uh, Aboriginal artworks, but I'm still not absolutely certain about what the reference these um, images mean or, or the parts of the image. Excellent. And that makes sense. <laughs> that ab ma absolutely makes sense. And maybe um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to pick up on that word viewpoint. I think. I think that I think it's an important idea. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> I think it was. I don't know whether I'm right here, but it seems to be connected with what I was saying yesterday about points of view. Mm -hmm. And these are embodied. Yes. Um, and exactly. so you have your your you're, you're in, engaged with different ontologies mm -hmm. uh, and their context. And the interesting thing for me about these two things is that it's to do with this notion of, I think it's Leotard who talks about this notion of a different, mm -hmm. where you have very contrasting points of view. Um, and yet, um, one of them, one of them is dominant, which wipes away the other one. I think Absolutely. About, I think he talks about this in relation to your country in terms of the the dispute over land, mm -hmm. but the dispute is governed by uh, what we might call Western law, mm -hmm. as opposed to Indigenous law. The Indigenous mm -hmm. law doesn't have a say. Absolutely. So. That's fantastic. And basically, I could get you to take over the lecture now, Dennis. So that would be great. <laughs> um, but this is the this was just one small strategy. So the first image on the right is uh, by Tom Roberts called The Breakaway. And the second is by Patty Bedford. Um, and it's called Two Women Looking at the Bedford Downs Massacre, done in 2002. So just briefly, we drilled, drilled down into the complex mind of uh, the audience of us, and we had different conceptual fields and, and stories to tell. And these two stories, these two paintings, talks about the story of colonial occupation through the management and control of the land represented by the protagonist in Tom Roberts' Australian Impressionist painting on the right, who is centralised as a subject not in relation to the world, but to the center, it is in the center of the world, a colonizing practice through Western art perspective. And that's what Dennis was talking about. And then we went to Paddy Bedford on the left, who's a senior law man of the Gidja people of East Kimberley region. And that on the other hand, demonstrates both the sovereign connection to place and the brutal occupation of colonizers that included the Bedford Down massacres, where 11 members of his community were poisoned by strychnine and then burnt. So if you count those 11 circles and you think about that fire, um, you've got 
his 11 members of his community who were poisoned and then burnt. But what do you think may be those tracks above based on that context, those signs above? And we were talking about perspective before, and I think, um, um, yes, well, well, I'll just keep moving on. Those two above, those two circles above are two women looking on the massacre and those lines going across the centre of them are the car of the Bedford truck going through. So it's a, like you said, Dennis, it was a different perspective. So offering, so moving on, offering space for dialogic meaning making through a visual methodology is a useful tool to unpick specific details that are often not seen or heard. So when all of the senses are engaged, there is a deeper listening that can offer ways to engage students in a stronger understanding of their ontologies and epistemologies. This practice also makes obvious how the colonial project arrays understanding and knowledge and narrows the view in such a way that made Western knowledge appear as universal knowledge. So a critical visual methodology is useful to highlight where and how political projects have always occurred and how in the Australian context, Indigenous people have continued to reinsert sovereignty in diverse ways. A critical and decolonizing visual methodology enables us to read images as modes of political activism. As Patty Bedford's work does, it's a political act. It's a political reinsertion of sovereignty and um, it demonstrates the ways in which local specific contexts speak back to and frame the new negotiations to engage with the state. So as much as the Australian state would like to continue this erasure, there is continued processes of negotiation and response. But in the context of schooling and, and um, unis, universities, students recognise their own cultural codes are not fixed and normative semiotic systems can be coupled, unpacked, coupled with learning diverse semiotic fields in relation to each other. Shifts begin to occur from multiple standpoints. Power relations shifts, a student begin to listen attentively and begin to unpack their own race, class and gender files. When they recognise how representations are constructed through signifying practices and how knowledge is produced, they begin to create very different work. And in the context of my, my context in Australia, it is planning to become uh, teachers, but I'm certainly inspired by um, Stuart Hall's work on representation in this specific context. So unlearning is a key element that helps students see what they do not see what they do not know in a sense. So that is the question, how do I know what I know? So by, by examining the, through the lens of how do I know what I know, it creates more space. It, and uh, coupled with employing a visual methodology that supports reassembling standpoints that are not grounded in binaries, but instead is attuned to modes of listening to Indigenous knowledges and practices informed by critical decolonial pedagogy. So what, what does deep listening actually mean. So in this slide, Miriam Rose, um, Naniwu Elder, talks to this idea of embodied deep listening. And in a sense, she's been leading the way for the notion of reconnection, for belonging, for contemplating, for um, making space, um, for that healing. So this idea of dardiri is inner listening, it's deep listening, it's, it's still awareness. And relationality in this context includes listening with an ethics of care. Listening informs an, an extended ethics of care that includes the environment and deep listening, which we need now, of course, more than ever. Operating in the effective cognitive and aesthetic domains through practices and strategies, helps us move towards a relational understanding of ourselves in the world rather than at the centre of the world. However, equally holding responsibility of past wrongs made visible through dialogue is also an important convention. It is not just building an expanded semantic field of knowledge, but also being in conversation about the, how the systems of whiteness continue, continue to privilege some. 
And Spivak suggests this be done in site-specific ways rather than generic ways in order to examine the particular formations of privilege, power and knowledge contextually. So in this sense, it's relationality and being unclosed in combination with deep listening. So Compridus prefers to think of this kind of political receptivity as one becoming unclosed, unlike some abstract free-floating openness to anyone or anything, unclosing involves struggle, a struggle with ourselves to open up what is now closed or what has never been opened. And similarly, Foucault talks about this idea of um, applying what the ancients called deep listening or the skill of listening, talking about, um, you know, during conversation, you know, not butting in in a sense, making sure the message is heard. He says it in a much more sophisticated way, such as Plutarch makes apprenticeship in silence an essential component of a good education. During conversation, we should allow time before making repost to allow for reflection on the meaning and implication of the message heard that we may adequately perceive its reason. Beyond silence, correct listening also calls for a dis disciplined physical demeanour. And he goes on to talk about active listening requiring these set of rules. So breaking free of Foucault and these particular ancient ways of understanding listening, I prefer to use these frames. So the aesthetic, academic and effective domains in combination. So whilst I haven't had much opportunity to work using multiple strategies and we only use one, which was vote with your seat, where we used our bodies. I think of how these things triangulate and how important it is to move the body, whether it's along a sociometric, to see where one stands in relation to others with a provocation, to consider ways in which how we sit in relation to each other and how that can be create and or create a community of practice with a group of students. So in conclusion, um, thinking about how this community of learners is generated and also overall alongside the material practice of decolonization is the theoretical frameworks by Indigenous led and research centralizes decolonization and, in shape, and shapes Indigenous settler futurity through the lens of epistemological decolonization. In cultivating whiteness, scarce the artists shifts representational fields where new modes of meaning are generated, shifts binary frames and produces new exchanges of meaning. It is located within a historiographic framework that is pedagogic and operates on the effective domain where audiences are confronted with the genocidal histories built on the flawed scientific theories of social Darwinism. And Gastensi also talks about entirely new modes of thought grounded in indigeneity and its material conditions that are not merely a theoretical correction, but a new foundation for material decolonization. So there is a pedagogical turn in the curatorial and institutional space towards educating as a public pedagogy, reconstructing the narrative by shifting the representational field through combining semiotic systems that informs a new mode of public culturing that is developed in a space of being unclosed. We need to create spaces for trust and reparative justice relies on trust, deep listening and dialogic meaning making that is embodied. The decolonizing project is exemplified by elders ongoing political and pedagogical agency that has carved the way by which negotiation should occur within the boundaries of respect, parity of recognition, as well as redistribution of land. And that's it.